Good morning. It is lovely to hear folks actually say good morning back to me. Welcome to worship here at First United Presbyterian Church of Troy. Uh, welcome to all of you who are here in the room with me. Welcome to those who are watching from home. We are glad to have all of you here. We are glad to have you joining us here on the second Sunday after Pentecost. Um, Today we will be celebrating Holy Communion, so if you uh, don't have your communion elements, if you didn't bring those along, you can grab some in the back of the, uh, in, in the entryway. Uh, if you're at home, grab your communion elements, whatever you have on hand is great, and we will be uh, celebrating together in a little bit. Uh, our offering plates are in the, in the back of the sanctuary and at the side of the sanctuary. We will not be taking up an offering during the service. So uh, you can give at either place or we have uh, giving online via Tithely. And that information is available on our website. For those of you who haven't been here before or just need a little refresher, um, at the end of the service, we ask that you please just remain where you're at and the ushers will dismiss you. We will leave uh, trying to maintain social distancing and we'll leave out the side door. Um, I believe that, are, that is all of the announcements. So again, welcome, welcome home. The peace of Christ be always with you.
Would you join with me in the gathering words? Behold how good and pleasant it is when siblings dwell in unity. There we go. All right. Let's try that again. Behold how good and pleasant it is when siblings dwell in unity. Or like the stillness of a sunset after a long day's work. When the faith community dwells in harmony, Let us pray. Gracious God, we come to this day having seen the miracles of everyday creation in our world. We have enjoyed both the bright sunshine and the gentle rains. We've marveled over the beauty of flowers and the complexity of your creation. Make our hearts ready to receive your word for us today so that we may go forth from this place ready to joyfully serve you all of our days. Amen. At this time, I have one announcement. Um, Pat Carlson, who has been a longtime member here at First United, uh, she will soon be moving uh, to be closer to her daughter, Kendra. And since visitation is still restricted at the facility, uh, we've arranged to have her join us today for our coffee chat on Zoom after the service. So that's at 11 o'clock today, beginning at 11 from 11 to 12. So um, 
if you've got a few, even if it's a few minutes, um, if you can, stop by and uh, give your love to Pat and wish her well. Are there any other announcements this morning? Yes. Okay, so adult faith ed will, will be next Sunday, because um, we're having that on the second and fourth Sundays, and so beginning next week, we'll be moving our coffee chat time to 1130 to allow people to actually get home from church so that they can uh, participate. So today, coffee chat, 11 o'clock, starting next week, 1130. Any other announcements? Yes. So if you don't do Zoom and you would like to see Pat, uh, she will be at the clubhouse at Beachwood today from 11 to 12. That's where she'll be connecting to our coffee chat. Uh, but you can see her in person if, if you're only there for a few minutes. We don't uh, have too many folks there at once. So, And she will be moving to Connecticut within a few days. So um, maybe a week, yeah. But we'll have that address for you if you'd like to send her uh, cards. Um, we'll get that out in the weekly newsletter. Any other announcements? All right. We do have um, some prayer requests from Peggy D. She's sharing the joy that her twin grandsons, Will and Cal, graduated this weekend. So congratulations to Will and Cal and asking prayers for granddaughter Maggie, who's living away from home in California and is uh, dealing with some health issues. So prayers for Maggie. Are there other joys, concerns, things to pray for this morning? Yes. Prayers for a, a young family who uh, has been having some issues and had to move this week and uh, suffered a miscarriage. Um, prayers for them. Others. As we lift our hearts, as we lift those things that are perhaps heavy on our hearts, those things that are joyful, but we don't want to share aloud. We know that God does hear, and God cares, and God does respond. So let us go now to God in prayer. Loving God, in this season of growth, open our hearts to grow in your love. Help us to truly trust in your creative process in our lives. We look around and we see the beauty of your world, the blossoming flowers and plants, the growth of children, the joy of celebrations, of graduation and marriage, of receiving new life. And we also see the sadness and the sorrow that has invaded the world when systems of injustice and hatred lay claim to people's lives. Prepare us, O oh God, to become ambassadors of peace and hope. Help us to place our trust in you so that when we are serving others, they may come to know your abiding love and power. Give us courage and great joy as we serve you. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen Let us be in the spirit of prayer. God of truth, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth. For Jesus' sake, amen. The reading this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, verses 20 through 35. Then Jesus went home. And again, such a crowd gathered that he and the disciples were unable even to eat a meal. When Jesus' relatives heard of this, they went out to take charge of him, thinking that he had lost his mind. The religious scholars who had come down from Jerusalem said of Jesus, he is possessed by Beelzebub. He casts out demons through the ruler of demons. Summoning them, Jesus spoke in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a realm is torn by civil strife, it cannot last. If a household is divided according to loyalties, it will not survive. Similarly, if Satan has suffered mutiny in the ranks and is torn by dissension, the devil is finished and cannot endure. No attacker can enter a stronghold unless the defender is first put under restraint. Only then can the attacker plunder the stronghold. The truth is, every sin and all the blasphemy the people utter will be forgiven, but those who blaspheme against the Holy Spirit will never have forgiveness. They are guilty of an eternal sin. Jesus spoke all this because they said, he is possessed by an unclean spirit. Jesus' mother and brothers arrived and sent in a message asking for him. 
a crowd was sitting around Jesus, and they said to him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Jesus replied, Who is my mother? Who is my family? And looking around at everyone there, Jesus said, This is my family. Anyone who does the will of God, that person is my sister, my brother, my mother. The Word of God. Let us be in the spirit of prayer. Speak to us today, O oh God, not what I would have to say, but what you would have each of us to hear. Amen. So what does it mean to be family? We often describe the church community as a family. This is the place where we come to find unconditional love and a sense of belonging, those things that are crucial to being part of a, a good family. And some have used this passage, this particular passage from Mark, to support the idea even that our church family in certain ways is more important perhaps than our family of origin. After all, not all of us had that picture-perfect family and the church or perhaps another chosen kin group may have been the first place where we've really truly felt at home. And as a faith community, we should be that kind of group. The ones who tell each other, I'm here for you. I love you no matter what. Because honestly, it doesn't matter what kind of family you come from. It never hurts to hear that we're loved, right? It doesn't matter how many times you've heard that. It never hurts to hear again that you are loved. But there's a danger involved in, in using all this family talk within a church. And it's something that I want us to be aware of. Whenever we talk about ourselves as a family, it creates this kind of circle, this in-group. And to a guest, a visitor, a newcomer, it carries this unspoken implication, perhaps, that we are a family and that they are not a part of it, at least not yet, right? Not yet. And I'm not suggesting that we stop talking or thinking about ourselves as a family, but I would urge us to be more deliberate about the words that we use and think about what they might convey to others. Think about those times when perhaps you were the outsider, when you married into a family when you started a new school or, or walked into a new church, when you started a new job or, or moved to a new city or maybe even a new country, how did it feel during those times to be on the outside? Did you feel welcome in a group where everyone else already knew each other? Did some people seem a little standoffish? What was it that set you apart from the others? How were you finally able to become part of that group? Or, or were you able to become part of that group? But now think about a group that you walked into and, and immediately felt at home. What was different about that group? How were you welcomed? What, was there something that you did differently? Was there something about the way that the people in that circle acted toward you? These are all things that we need to keep in mind as we welcome new folks into our church family. And there's another danger in thinking about our church in familial terms. And perhaps this is the more dangerous one. 
See, we might start to think of ourselves as one great big happy family that always gets along, that, that never has any problems, that always agrees about everything, where everyone pitches in with the chores, where we only say nice things about each other, and where we never, ever, ever get angry or stomp off in a huff, right? That's ne that never happens in the church, right? I don't have to see your mouths right now. I know. <laughs> I can see the smiles under those masks. You know that's not the case. You know that's not how church families always work. Even the best of church families have their moments of disagreement and fighting. Just because we're a church doesn't mean that we always treat each other right, that we always treat each other nicer than other families or act any better than any other kind of family. And it's not a great thing, but it's okay because we are human. We're human, but we need to keep those things in mind. Now, I'm about to go kind of a little Bible nerd on you, and I, I know um, Mark is one of my favorite books. And this, this stuff is right in my wheelhouse, and I love it. And so if you just zone out for a minute, just bear with me. I promise there's, some, there's a point to all of this. But this is so cool. See, Mark has this way. I know it's a short book. It sounds like campfire tales. It sounds like just one thing after another. He's just telling the stream of consciousness story about Jesus. And that's all well and good, and that's awesome. But he also has a way of telling his stories. He has a way of crafting and structuring those stories and highlighting a central idea in this text by bookending it. See, Mark will take a, a special idea and he'll bookend it with these other ideas that are similar in another part of the story. And this way of reading begins and ends with these ideas of home and family. That's what this one does. So this passage that Dawn read begins and ends with family, and we know that that points to something in the middle that is the important part that Mark is trying to point toward. Now in this passage, Jesus goes home, right? He goes home, that's how it starts, but the crowd that's following him has gotten so big that he can't even make it inside his own front door, so his family comes outside to get him. So Jesus goes home, and his family comes outside to meet him. And then at the end of the passage, we have these same concepts. Jesus is told, hey, your family is outside, and they're in the crowd looking for you. And Jesus responds by saying, who is my family he says, whoever does the will of God is my sister, my brother, my mother. Family on both ends there. Now, can you imagine how hurt his mom and his siblings must have been to hear that? How hurt they must have felt when he said, who is my family? And this isn't the only time that Jesus wrestles with these kinds of family issues. At 12 years old, we remember his frazzled parents getting the typical preteen kind of attitude when they find him in the temple after looking for him for days. Why were you looking for me? Didn't you know this is where I was going to be? Well, obviously not, Jesus, because if we did, we'd have come right here instead of looking for you for three days. And at a wedding in Cana, Jesus gets annoyed with his mom. Yeah, he did. He got annoyed with his mom when his mom said, hey, they're out of wine. Jesus says, how is that my problem? And she says, stop what you're doing and take care of this situation. 
And at the end of his life, Jesus again challenges what it means to even be family. When he instructs John to take care of Mary, saying, this is your mom now. And to Mary, she, telling her, this is your son now. And we know that Jesus had siblings, and yet he chose family for Mary. He chose his beloved disciple to be her caretaker. There are so many nuances to this concept of family and what it means to be family. And in our gospel reading today, Mark urges us to look closer, to take this bookended text of home and family and to look at the core, the central part of that teaching. And right in the middle of this passage, we come to verse 25, where Mark says, A house divided against itself cannot stand. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Unfortunately, even our language of family and home can cause division within our church community. When we speak of our church family as some kind of in-group, we risk alienating those who do not yet see themselves as part of this group, as part of this family. And so we must be deliberate when speaking about our church community. See, there is room for everybody within God's family. There is room for every person in God's family. And we are called to be intentional in the way that we welcome others into this first united family. And when we seek to do that, when we seek to live together in unity, to be a family, to treat each other the way family is supposed to treat each other, when we seek to rid ourselves of the attitudes, the language, the actions that divide us, when we work together, when we follow that example set forth by Jesus, we are given a promise. See, those walls of division are broken down. Our house will be stronger. This church will become a haven of unconditional love, of compassion, of forgiveness. That's what truly makes this a family. That's what truly makes us a family is becoming that haven of unconditional love, of compassion, of forgiveness. Not thinking that we're perfect, but knowing that we're not. And offering love anyway. Offering forgiveness anyway. Offering compassion. Because we have been loved. Because we are loved by God. That's what makes us family. Not the fact that we all get along in perfect harmony because we don't. Not the fact that we never fight with each other over silly things because we do. Not even the fact that for the most part we do get along with each other. We do enjoy spending time together and having fun together. Those are good and important things, but that is not what makes us a family. Jesus said, whoever does the will of God is my sister, my brother, my mother. Whoever does the will of God is my family. And that's why we're a family. Because we've come together with a common goal of doing the will and the work of God. And what is the number one thing that God wants us to do? It's to love. It's to love as we have been loved, love as we are loved. 
Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, it's love. Love God. Love your neighbor. As long as we keep our vision focused on doing the will of God, we're going to remain a family. We're going to remain an awesome family. And our family has been called to share that message of God's love, starting right here in our little community and moving outward from there. So I encourage us, let us continue that work. I know that we are a loving group of people. We don't always get along, but we do mostly. But even when we don't, we still love one another, right? And that is what we're called to do. So let's continue that work. Let us show love. Let us feel that love of God and show it to one another and to others. Let us welcome others into this circle of love. Let us help our little family grow in both strength and in numbers as we help others to learn about the unconditional love of our awesome, awesome God. A house divided against itself cannot stand, but a house built in love, that is a solid foundation. Amen. people who have come from many places, embodying many differences, different ages and races, different sexualities and identities, differing politics and theologies, all one people at one meal, 
to discover and remember the truth of God's love, that our differences need not be something that we simply tolerate, but blessings which we celebrate. The more difference we embody, the more fully we experience the presence of God in our midst. So come, family of God, come just as you are, wherever you've been, whatever wounds you bear today, you are welcome here, in this place, among these people, at this meal. To encounter the love of God, which is our sustenance, and our strength. I invite you now to join with me in the prayer of confession. When we forget that God's ways lead all to the blessings of justice and mercy. mercy. When we forget that God's ways lead all, especially the most vulnerable, to blessings of safety, health, and meaningful work. When we forget that God's ways lead all to the blessings of the shared abundance of God's beloved creation. Jesus reminds us, Who is my mother? Who is my family? Anyone who does the will of God, that person is my sister, my brother, my mother. In Christ, we are forgiven all of our failed efforts at community and invited afresh to rejoin the family of God, seeking blessings for all. Thanks be to God. Amen. May the God of steadfast love be with you. Siblings in Christ, lift your hearts to God. Beloved of God, sing glad praises to God. Songs of wonder are offered to our God. The strength of our resistance comes from the regularity of our remembrance. And so that we might resist, we remember that we, lesbian, gay, queer, and questioning, bisexual, trans, intersex, and asexual, that we are created in your image, that our breath is the same breath that hovered over the waters at creation's birth. We remember that even as we abandoned you, you still remembered us. Resisting closets of our own creation, self-hatred, selfish ambition, and pride, you continued to seek us out, even when we forgot who we were. We remember your only begotten, Jesus, who put on flesh like us and taught us what it meant to be fully who you'd created us to be. He touched the untouchable, healed the incurable, and welcomed those who had given up hope of ever finding their place or tribe. Through him we see a path not just toward our freedom, but toward the liberation of the whole world. Jesus taught us that it's not in the brutality of violence or in rulings of law that the world will be saved. Rather, it will be in showing kindness to our neighbor, in standing up against evil and injustice, in returning hate with love, in transforming the world one heart at a time. It will be in the simple and holy task of dining together and in learning to see one another as beloved, just as you have seen us. We know this because on a night of both celebration and betrayal. Jesus took bread, 
left over on the table. And he blessed it and broke it and commanded those who love him to eat and to remember every time that they broke the bread thereafter. That it's in the breaking that we become whole. That in losing our lives, we find them. That in serving, we are served. And likewise, after they'd broken the bread, he took the cup, blessed and shared it, and commanded them to drink from it and remember his lifeblood poured out as living grace for them and for all who would receive it. And he told them that every time they drank after that, to remember that grace that was poured out for all, all people who would receive it. And so we pray with boldness and in our need that you would come upon us, Holy Spirit, and upon these gifts of bread and cup, Make of them the body of Christ brought to life in our sharing and the blood of Christ to nourish us in the works of witness and justice to which we've been called. In our fellowship here, may our eyes be opened that we may recognize the strength in the communion between us, that from our memory of your faithfulness, we might find renewed hope for the journey to which we've been called that we may recognize as pilgrims together in this journey toward justice, we might see each other and all whom we meet as those whom you've named and claimed as your beloved. Amen. I invite you at this time to take your own elements, whatever you've brought or received at the door, if you're using one of those little ones that you received at the door, make sure that you only open one side at a time. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to get a lap full, and that's not going to be fun. We remember that night Jesus took the bread and blessed and broke it. And he shared it with his disciples as the grain scattered becomes one loaf, when we eat this bread, we become one with one another. And sharing this bread is a sharing of the body of Christ. And so I invite you now to take and eat. Amen. As the grape finds life in the vine, when we drink this cup, we become at one with the source of life itself. And so I invite you now to take and drink. Amen. Thank you. 
Would you join with me in the prayer after communion? Gracious God, we thank you for this feast of life. Through this meal, we are united with Christ and with one another. We have been fed by your love and strengthened by the Spirit. Now send us forth to feed as we have been fed, forgive as we have been forgiven, and love as we have been loved. Amen. welcome others with the love that we have been given. Go now in the name of the Creator and of Christ and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let the ushers come forward. And they will release you row by row, and you'll be going out the back door here through our exit. Thank you. Thank you. 